then today is let me continue on, um, you know, going through more than the mode of action, but in some cases be a little more specific about what the mechanism of action is and hopefully reinforce some of the stuff you've seen in lab. Okay? And um, so recall that in this group, we're looking, these are materials that are typically applied foliarly, so to the leaves. Um, most of them are relatively uh, easily transported, although not all. And um, so we had talked about, uh, you know, the glyphosates and, and the oxen mimics and so forth, okay? And we finished, I believe, we did some of the ALS inhibitors, the uh, nickel sulfuron and so forth. The next big group here, okay, are what we call the bleachers, okay? In, in, in common terms, are they inhibit uh, carotenoid pigmentation, okay? And that explains in part why you see the symptoms as being this, this white bleached look to these plants. What are some of the key herbicides in this group here? The different families, okay? And in, in, in bold yellow here are the, uh, the herbicides that, um, that uh, at least are on your list of 16. And correct me if I'm wrong, we do have fomosafin up there, right? We don't have acifluorophan on your list. Because I, I know I've changed it from year to year depending on what we have. Uh, not to say you've also seen some oxyfluorophan or gold. Do you remember in what flag you saw that this week? What was gold used for? Or where were we trying to use it? Do you remember? Cabbage. Cabbage. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to ask where did we see it, but I just... It's one that, you know, you might have come, you know, we did come across. And, of course, mesotrione or calista, one of our newer herbicides. Again, this is the kind of for the practical that you want to have this. Some one or two uh, of these herbicides on your exam because of easily recognizable symptomology, okay? The sclerosis or whitening, okay? It's usually a vivid white and sometimes it's tinged with a little pink, pink or purple on there, okay? Just a little bit and, and I'll show you. Okay? Now, I should say that movement is relatively restricted, although I say they're, they're, they're easily moved. They actually don't move that well, um, except for a couple of them, and the example here would be Amitrol, okay, which is uh, really, moves really nicely, pretty good control of uh, perennials, okay? Because if something doesn't move very well, it's going to be tough to control perennials. And I've used, with one of the growers back in Canada, I was using Amitrol, um, to control uh, horsetail, okay? Equisetum, our vents. Remember our horsetail looks like a little pine seedling. Hardly any leaves. Glyphosate doesn't do a thing on it. I mean, it just kind of burns because there's not enough foliage. Amitrol is able to get in there and do a pretty good job. So if any of you down the road, usually if you have wet areas in your fields or, or near ditches, that's where the uh, horsetail is going to move in, okay? So, um, but... Usually what happens is that you, you at least have some good movement in the shoots, and, so, you know, and that's really where you need it. Uh, what these herbicides do, what the, you know, the mode of action we talk about, they, they inhibit the formation of carotenoids, okay? And if you're wondering, so what? So, okay, this thing becomes white. What's the big deal? What really is going on is, is and what role the carotenoids provide, it's not just because they're orange or they're, you know, they provide other you know, nice colors, is they protect chlorophyll, okay, from something called photooxidation, i.e., under intense light, typically under, you know, strong light and oxygen, um, some, the, some, the chlorophyll actually, you know, is, becomes a radical, and I'll show you this, becomes very active, very unstable, and what carotenoids do if they're present, which you hope they are, is they quench, they take in that excess energy such that the, the chlorophyll is not broken down, okay? So the bleaching, what happens is it's not due to the fact that the carotenoids are gone, it's due to, to the fact that chlorophyll is just broken down because of this excess energy, and I'll, I'll show you that in a little more detail, okay? So the loss of car carotenoids results in the destruction of chlorophyll. Remember chlorophyll, that's the green pigmentation, it's gone, no photosynthesis, and you get the bleaching, and eventually the plant dies. Now, one important thing, carotenoid pathways or biosynthesis is pretty complicated, and I'll show you, um, you know, one of, a, a key pathway for one or two key uh, carotenoids. By no means do I ask you to remember all of them, but I just want you to point out that basically, okay, the specific herbicides, not all of the bleachers affect the same enzyme in this pathway, and I'll show you. That's really what... The exact enzym enzymatic step differs 
depending on the different, so mesotrione doesn't affect the same, okay? So if you look at here, mesotrione will not affect the same enzyme as clomazone, which will not affect the same one as amitrol, but it's all in the biosynthetic carotenoid pathway, okay? So let me take you through the process of what happens to chlorophyll, and if carotenoids are in there, what's going to happen, okay? So, and this is referred to as photolight, the oxidation in light of chlorophyll. You have no chlorophyll, you've got no green pigmentation, you've got no photosynthesis, you've got no ATP, no NADPH, that's the currency that needs to go into, remember the Calvin cycle to produce your, your glucose, okay? No food, basically, for your plant. So, let's take a look at that, okay? Here it is. The key function of carotenoids, in simple terms, and you have those in your notes, okay? is preventing photooxidation, especially under a high light. On a sunny day, it's warm. If you have no, car <coughs> no carotenoids, you're going to have issues. <coughs> okay? So, <coughs> excuse me. Under such situations, then, excess energy from this high intensity is absorbed by chlorophyll. So chlorophyll will initially take this light, in light intensity, <coughs> and causes what, what happens is you have a very stable form of chlorophyll called the singlet chlorophyll molecule, the 1CHL, that's, it's there, it's present, it's taking that energy. And when it absorbs that energy, it basically is converted to a very reactive triplet, what we call triplet chlorophyll molecule, i.e. that is the equivalent of a radical molecule, something that can really destroy, okay, membranes and so forth, okay? So... This is, right now, becomes, so you've got sun hitting these leaves, it's, it's hot, okay? Chlorophyll is converted to a very reactive form. If this chlorophyll triplet is not taken care of, it's going to destroy your membranes. It's, it's, it's dangerous for plants, it's dangerous, okay, for membranes. So, normally, though, if, you know, we're not using any of these uh, bleaching herbicides, what normally happens is that th this excess energy of this very reactive triplet chlorophyll molecule is transferred to carotenoids and they basically dispose of it or dissipate the energy in a safe way for the plant. Okay? And there's, there's all steps involved there. But keep that in mind. So the carotenoids, they have to be there. If they're not there, what happens to that triplet? You're going to have trouble. So <clears throat> if carotenoid synthesis is inhibited then, <clears throat> This energy, okay, is not dissipated. What happens is it basically goes wild in the cell and starts becoming really damaging, okay? And, and, and so starts degrading, <laughs> destroys chlorophyll, and peroxidizes the cell membranes. And I'll show you how typically things are peroxidized. You, you basically, yeah, hydrogen peroxide is, is produced, and that is such a very, very uh, problematic um, compound to have in tissues. It basically breaks the cells up. That's where you get the leakage, okay? So, with no new synthesis of carotenoids, okay, basically, chlorophyll in the new plant tissue degrades, and that's why you start getting the white color, okay? It's, it's just not there. There's no green. Dead. And also, okay, the plant tissues degrade and you lose pigmentation. You get this whitish appearance. Okay, the pigmentation goes. There's no carotenoids because these enzymes, and I'll show you, they affect this pathway that produces carotenoids. Okay, so that's... And what happens, of course, is then when the cell membranes, because of this peroxidation, okay, this triplet chlorophyll is, n is not, the energy is not quenched, it's gone crazy inside the cell, it destroys cell membranes, and of course, then you get leaking of the cytoplasm and, the, you know, basically um, very quick desiccation. These tend to, to react fairly quickly, okay? So in your own mind, you've got to understand the, the steps involved. You've got high light intensity, okay, hitting a chlorophyll molecule, which is within the chloroplast, kind of the basic, I'll show you some of that. That energy converts a very stable singlet chlorophyll molecule to a very reactive, unstable triplet chlorophyll molecule that if the carotenoids were there, that energy would be quenched, the plant would go ahead doing its normal functions. When the carotenoids are inhibited from being synthesized, how are they going to be inhibited? By these herbicides. 
the bleachers. If, they're not, if that's not being produced, well, what happens is then you've got all these steps, okay, that occur and you get the leakness and that's where you get that bleaching, okay? Here are some of the herbicides, again, just to give you an idea. What are we talking about here? Here's mesotrione, again, um, double benzene ring, typical sulfur is there, okay? You got, you know, methyl groups and so forth. But these are some of the, some of the others. Clomazone, which is an important one, amitril, fluoridone, okay? That's the one that they were using sonar. Um, it's one that they use in aquatic systems as well to control the, and that's the one that was being sprayed on the turf that, created that circle because of watering. Uh, and remember, there was a, a, you couldn't use this product or at least take water out uh, within 30 days of using it. And of course, that golf superintendent was spraying, you know, was using it to, to water, water the turf or the green. And of course, it didn't follow the recommendations and it pretty well killed all his turf, okay? Here's the kind of stuff you're gonna see, right? I mean, you all, you all know that. This is, this is uh, clomazone, okay? And why is it clomazone? If I, this, is, this would be a good example to give you, you know, here's, I take this flat and I show you what, what was sprayed here. Why would you say that it's not mesotrione? Why is it not Callisto? Because Callisto is registered for use in corn. Okay, and this is used, the, and, you know, um, and you've got commander clomazone is used in soybean, pumpkins, peppers, peas, okay? This is what you're gonna, the kind of stuff you're going to get on that exam in a couple of weeks. So as soon as you see this, you should be, okay, it's a pigment inhibitor, uh, bleacher. Now, which one? Mesotrione? Uh, is it acephlorophen? Okay. Or is it, uh, or is it command? Clomazone. So, but this is, this is what you're getting, basically. Just kind of look to it. Here's some more. Um, here's the corn. You, as I mentioned, you also get a bit of purpling, okay? Now, this is clomazone in corn. They're, they're showing you, um, I was pulling this off. Uh, one of my colleagues has a website. Um, he's out in the Midwest. And uh, they're all often uh, trying to figure out what, why did they get injury to a, to a crop that's nearby where clomazone was sprayed. And so uh, typically you wouldn't be spraying clomazone or command on corn. It's not registered in corn. But they got injury. And they, part of the, the, you know, what the students have to do is try to figure out what could have happened. Why did it, did it get there? And, um, and this, is, this is the symptomology. What could have happened is that there, was, there might have been carryover of clomazone uh, from one season to the other, particularly in, in a dry season uh, where there isn't a lot of moisture to break down the, the command. And so you have to be really careful that you might have residues. Not only is it prone to, to drift, but it's also prone to sitting on that soil. And you go next year, let's say you've got soybean this year, and you go next year and you've got corn and it's been a dry year, you may have had failure of command to control weeds. You might get the situation where your corn gets hammered. And it's not going to grow out of that damage. That's, that corn is, is done. And if you've got you know, a couple hundred acres or 500, uh, you're in trouble. This was from one of our uh, flats. I pulled some of these images. If you haven't already visited my lab website, you should, because on, on the left-hand column, there's, there's a, a button that basically says herbicides, and I have some pictures. I have basically the 16 or a few more of the herbicides that you need to know. You might want to just kind of browse through. It's, I've taken pictures like some of you are doing and just posted them. I don't have it for all the herbicides, uh, but you might want to go in there, and that's where I pulled some of these just to show you, okay? So... There is the complicated pathway. Can you imagine if I'd ask you, come on, you know, regurgitate this back? But this, all it's showing you, the end products is, is a very complicated pathway that leads to carotenes. These are carotenoids, both an alpha and a beta. These are, the fun, these are what will absorb that very reactive chlorophyll molecule that won't destroy. So if this is not, this pathway is inhibited in any way, you're not going to get the carotenoids you're going to have major damage. Chlorophyll, the triplet radical molecule, will cause problems. And so what I, meant, what I said at the outset was that each of these herbicides, in most cases, affects a different enzyme that's important in the manufacturing or the synthesis of these carotenoids. And just to show you, and again, I would not ask you, you know, where is clomazone fit in there? But here's clomazone affecting an enzyme that's actually, because it's so long, people just call it the uh, DOCS-PS enzyme, okay? one deoxy deoxylose uh, 5 phosphate synthase. So that's where clomazone affects, 
when you, you know, specifically the mechanism. So you would say this is the, it affects the DOX PS enzyme, which then, of course, if this is inhibited, you don't get this feeding. The whole chain basically breaks down, okay? Whereas then you have products like uh, Fluoridone, Norfluorazon, they affect phytotene disasterase, which is actually a very, very important enzyme. These are all enzymes, okay? There's amitriol affecting two different enzymes, okay? What's neat is our newest herbicide, one of our newest herbicides, two of our newest herbicides, exasofrutol and mesotrion, which is callisto, what they do is they aff affect this, what's called the HPPD pathway. What does this pathway do? It, the end product of it is this phytine disaturase, which is an enzyme that's needed right here in the step. See where they say this is the pathway. We just broke it down for you. If this enzyme is not present because that's what mesotrione does, then there's no way. The whole system is backed up. Okay? You don't get these carotenoids. Okay? So basically the take-home message is that these bleaching type herbicides okay affect generally different herbic uh, different enzymes within the carotenoid biosynthetic pathway which is a pretty complicated pathway but they affect in different spots okay but the end product is the same is that basically you do not have the synthesis or the production of carotenoids which are important to absorb absorb that energy from that triplet chlorophyll radical okay and if that thing is loose in the cells, guess what happens? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk soon about paraquat. Why paraquat is dangerous, okay, even more so, is that, it, that the actual, okay, herbicide is a radical. The, the way it's formulated is actually a radical to start with, okay? That's why it's so, pro and you would say, why did they do it that way? Chemistry doesn't allow to, you know, it needs to be that, that reactive. That's, that's the only way they can do it. They try to, you know, see if they could, you know, not have it as a radical, in the radical form. It just, that's the way it is. Okay, that's why it's so, for, for humans, it's really a problem for animals. The toxicity is very high. So do you all get this idea of what carotenoids do? So when we, we talk about inhibit carotenoid synthesis, I want you to be able to think about, you know, what, what is happening. Why do we see what we see? Why do we see the bleaching? Okay? Just a quick reminder, some of you, you know, I, I'll say this is happening in the chloroplasts or I'll say this is in the stroma and it's kind of like, what is he talking about? Just want to make sure you guys, remember the cell? This is a basic cell. I mean, most of you should know this, but I just, here are the, here are the chloroplasts, okay? These organelles within cells, plant cells, okay? And then you take one of these and you cut them, okay? Just here's the outer membrane, here's the inner, that's a chloroplast. And then you've got these stacks, these grana, stacks of tylocoid membranes. There's the inter, you know, intermembrane spaces. There's the stroma, which is kind of what surrounds these grana, almost like buildings, in a sense. And there's these attachments in here are what we call the stroma lamella, okay, or lamellae. So, you know, when, and, and I'll say site of action is the stroma lamella. And, and you know, often it means nothing. I want you to at least have a picture of where this is happening. It's re in somewhere in the plant. It's in the in cells of plants and within the cells, within these organelles and within these organelles in specific sections, okay? Thylakoid membranes, you, you kind of hear about that, okay? So please keep that in mind. I'm not going to test your name, the, the, the structures, but often, you know, we get, get so, you know, there's a lot of information and, and we kind of forget the basics of where we're taught, where, where this is going on. It's not in space or, okay, it, it's actually out there, okay? So you would all, should all be able to tell me, at least in your own words, why we see the bleaching. If on prelim three I ask you, can you give me in your own words, take me through the process of when I apply mesotrione, okay, to a corn plant, or I wouldn't say corn plant, to, uh, you know, let, or a chromosome to a corn plant, okay, what happens? Can you take me through, in your own words, what is going on? I want you to be able to kind of tell me the kind of things I've talked about, that you get this, you know, formation of this very reactive triplet chlorophyll molecule and so forth, and take me through, without giving me all the steps there, okay? So, make sure you're, you're at ease with that. Okay, the next group is, again, one that you definitely want to see on the practical exam, and this is the group, the graminocytes, 
This is what we call the FOPs and the DIMs, okay, which are um, lipid biosynthesis inhibitors. Okay? If you have no lipids, you're going to have problems. Your membranes are going to have problems. Okay? Outer, inner membranes, plasma membrane, you're going to get leakage. Okay? And so these things, again, selectively control grasses. They're only applied post-emergent. Okay? And the, the example that we're, we've been using is Cetoxidem. But you've also seen some Fusilate, Fluazifop, or Acclaim. This is that herbicide that I told you controls grasses in wheat in other parts of the country, but it's not registered in New York because we don't seem to have much in terms of uh, you know, annual grass wheat pressure in our small grains. Okay? But it's whole grass. Dicoflop methyl is in this group. It's the aroxyphenoxypropene. It's the FOPs versus the DIMs. All of these affect... Okay, they destroy meristems. The growing, you know, where the plant actively glows, that's where you kind of just pull them and they basically turn brownish. Discoloration and disintegration of grass meristems at or above the nodes on the soil, okay, includes rhizomes. Okay, these things do move, they have good movement. They inhibit an enzyme called acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, short ACCase. That's why they're called ACCase inhibitors. This group is one of the groups where we've seen the fastest development of herbicide resistance. Within three years of use, the other group, ALS inhibitors, acetolactase synthesis, which we already talked about, nickel sulfuron, the accents, the halo sulfurons, the permits. Those two groups, because of their specificity, it's great. They don't affect, you know, they're not general, non-selective herbicides like Roundup, but plants can adapt to them. So site of action, ACCase in the stroma of plastids, chloroplasts the stroma, okay? Primary mechanism of action is they inhibit biosynthesis of fatty acids, which are, you know, comprised lipids, the building blocks, okay? And then, again, selectivity for grasses. We're not sure why it is that the grasses are so selectively, what is it about? They're still trying to figure that out. It might be transportation, it might be, they, they just metabolize the herbicide a lot better. Just want to point you to uh, remember thiocarbamates, okay, EPTC? What do you know about EPTC, its mode of action, or generally? Do you remember Eptam, eradicane? What does it do? It affects what? It affects the shoots more. It, it, it does have its primary mode of action, that's EPTC, is mitotic shoot inhibitor. But a secondary mode of action, okay, remember the primary is the one that, that basically first shuts down an important process in the plant. A secondary one, and that's why I put it here, is that it inhibits a, another enzyme, acetyl coenzyme A elongase. These are, and I'll show you in, in, in a picture what those are. These are enzymes that are important to produce membranes and so forth. And this occurs in, in, in what we call the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm not going to ask you to to worry too much about that, but I just want you to, because you're going to see it in this figure, you're going to say, wait, wait a minute, I, I thought you said this is a mitotic inhibitor. Why is it showing up here, you know, at least for EPTC? I'm saying that this is also one of the effects of EPTC is that it affects also, in a sense, uh, it's an inhibitor of, of lipids, okay? So here are some of the, the herbicides. The one that you're familiar with is Cetoxidem, okay? Let's look at the structure. Again, very much, the, you know, benzene, six carbon rings, okay, double, in, in this case, for fluazifob, dicofob, methyl. We'll talk about this when we talk about selectivity. Um, these were pictures I had taken in previous years in, in the greenhouse um, that I pulled off my website, but just to kind of show you, this is what we used to see. You know, basically the corn, there was, remember the corn, we have the soybeans, corn, I didn't take the alfalfa, but I just wanted to show you these things were just, you'd pull them out and they just, the corn would just be gone, and the grasses was the same thing. You saw that this week, and they just pulled right off, okay? You see it if by, um, by mistake it gets into corn, um, by drift and so forth, um, okay? Drift of the herbicide, you didn't want to, you were spraying clomazone, it moved, and that, it has a tendency to drift, so that's why people use it pre-emergence or PPI. You'll start getting again within corn, and you could actually pull... As the corn is just whirled, you can actually pull it right out. You know, you, the lower leaves stay in, and the, the you know, you cannot, and you just pull it out almost like a like a, you know, 
flower vase. Just think of this, if I just put my hand around it when it's really kind of basically done its damage, I can pull that right out. And, and all you have left is these leaves. The growing point just goes, okay, right at the node. So just to disintegrates basically the growing point. So this is just to show you the specific word, mechanism of action. What I want to show you is these are the precursors. You need this acetate pyruvate. You need this enzyme, acetyl coenzyme A. Oh, what all this does at the end of the day is uh, produces fatty acids, okay, which are very long, you know, chains that basically lead to the formation of wax, suberin, cutin. Remember, these are all important structures or components of cells and so forth. So, although this is complicated, this is the end product. You don't have any of these. You're going to get leakage. You're going to get major, you know, I mean, you get death, basically. And so what I'm saying is that the... The, fop, the FOPs and the DIMs basically inhibit ACCs, this enzyme. So this pathway is basically shot right there. So they, you never get this production. You don't get these fatty acids being produced, which means you have no wax, you have no cuticle, okay? Uh, so products can go, come in and go, and, and your cell content, cy cytoplasm just leaks. And these plants are gone, okay? Death occurs in the grasses. Does not occur in broadleaf weeds, which is kind of the interesting, why is that? Again, is it a question of transport, okay? Less sensitivity of this enzyme? That's what folks are looking at. And this is where the, carbo, the carbamothiates, and this is just to give me, this is EPTC. It affects this, okay, what are called these elongases, okay, which are important <laughs> enzymes that lead to the same thing. They're important in the transport. So think about EPTC affecting um, lipid biosynthesis further down in the chain. That's really what I want you to be to take home from here. And it's a secondary effect, okay? And that's why it affects also, we talked about it, it affects the shoots more, okay? Just like the, you know, it's almost the equivalent of what, okay, uh, we're seeing with the uh, graminicides here, with, with cetoxidem or fluoracid FOB, okay? So lipids. So as you're kind of going, what is it affecting and why is that important in a plant? And does that explain maybe the symptoms we're seeing? Okay. Again, I would not ask you to, you know, regurgitate, draw this for me, tell me where, but at least be aware of what the end products are and where some of these, you know, that they're affecting the EPTC and these FOPs and DIMs are affecting different parts of this lipid biosynthesis, okay, or the, or the production of fatty acids, okay. Again, if you, you know, there's, there's, I remember taking, uh, you know, two graduate courses in herbicide physiology and biochemistry. I mean, you go into the details of all these and you've got to, you know, run. This is not the goal here. I mean, it's, but just recognize that it's there. Okay? So, we've just covered. Remember I told you I have this, I'm trying to have you think about the scheme of how you're going to go organize these herbicides so that it's a little easier for you to remember. We've just, we, you know, prior to this, we've been talking about foliar applied herbicides that were translocated and showed initial symptoms on new growth. All of the ones that just went by from last class till, okay, the lipid inhibitors affected new growth. We now move to herbicides that are typically, not always, but typically applied to leaves. They're foliar applied, they move, but they affect old growth first. And the reason is, is because they're apoplastically transported. They go up the xylem, just like the nutrients in water. They don't follow the phloem. So they're not going to go to the sinks, okay, which could be the roots, tuber, storage organs, or meristematic stems, the, the growing points. These things are going to be, if you apply it on the leaves, they're going to move from, you know, follow the transpiration stream to the edges, okay, and out through transpiration. So damage is going to be older leaves if they come up from the soil. They're going to go from the, just think about where water is going to go. It's going to go first to the bottom leaves. And if it's applied to the leaves, it's going to go to the field, that, you know, to the leaf edges and margins. That's where you'll get the photosynthetic inhibitors. That's why we say look for damage, intervenal chlorosis, older leaves. This is the group. Xylem mobile, upward mobile, these are all synonyms. Acropedally translocated, going up instead of basipedally. Okay? So, just sometimes you'll hear all this terminology. That's what we're referring to. The biggest group in here are going to be the photosynthetic inhibitors. Linuron, bromoxanil, which is buctril, okay? Metribuzin is in there. 
atrazine is in this group. These guys are all going to give you injury in the older leaves first, and it's going to be at the, the, the margins. You're not going to get growing tips dying from atrazine. Okay? There are the, and they're divided in two groups because some are called, they're slower acting, called the classical group, which includes the s triazines Here are some examples, atrazine, cymazine, cyanazine, okay? Others, exazinone, metribuzin, substituted ureas, linuron, Lorox, okay? And the rapidly acting, I used to include the two of them in there, but I tried to cut down on how many herbicides you needed to know, but that's, these are a little more fast acting type herbicides, okay? And if you noticed in, in, in the greenhouse, the bromoxanil, you, you saw this, okay? Very, very important. This bentazon, I, I used it for my PhD. It's an important corn soybean herbicide that's put out by BASF. Really good product, okay? And bromoxanil, obviously, we talked about that. But that's, so I'm going to be talking about specifically, so they're photosynthetic inhibitors. But where? Where in photosynthesis are they doing damage? specifically, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about mechanism of action. Here's the structures of these things. There's atrazine, if you're wondering what, what it looks like, okay? So nitrogens, you've got the benzene ring, chlorophyll up there. Look at cymazine, very, very similar looking, okay? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to remember what the, the difference is. You've got this uh, CH2 group in there, okay? So again, just at least be aware of some of these, some of these products, at least what they somewhat look like. So what are the features, general features? Again, a lot of that is in there. Only translocated in the apoplast, primarily absorbed through roots, okay? Primarily applied to the soil, though most have foliar activity, okay? I've been saying they're foliar, op this group has a real mix in there, but atrazine can be applied pre, PPI, post. So you get a lot of this, okay? Application strategies are primarily PPI or pre, and to a limited extent post. And if they're post, they're early post. So even though I've got them under the big category, foliar applied, generally can, they're also pretty good soil applied herbicide. Okay? Look at this. Symptoms develop from the bottom of the shoot to the top, affecting older growth first. Okay? Although observed these, from the roots, these have no effect on root growth. That's interesting. They don't affect root growth. Okay, so they're, you, they've got, they're, they're going after the leaves. They're going to affect photosynthesis. Okay? Widely used group. This is a widely used, used in most crops, different herbicide, non-crop situated resistance issues, as you saw. You know, lamb squatter, you know, triazine, atrazine resistant lamb squatters. Big problem. 95% of our New York field crop fields are, have these lamb, resistant lamb squatters. Yes. Correct, correct. But the first case of resistance was in 1968 that people kind of looked at in the triazines, and it was, I think, to uh, cymazine out in the northwest somewhere, one uh, common ground zone, okay, uh, Senecio vulgaris. And then it's just exploded, lamb squatters, pigweed, but not as fast, you're right, it did. But now it's got a lot of resistance issues, okay? However, many of these have been used for a long time, right. So that, that's, that explains it too. Movement in soil is, is low to moderate, but varies with compound. So again, it's very variable. I tried to generalize and summarize it for you, but sometimes it's hard. What's nice about it is that they, most of these herbicides have relatively low mammalian toxicity. They're relatively safe. And again, I'll use the word in brackets. But then again, you heard the issues with atrazine impacting, uh, you know, uh, frogs and the fact that some of them were hermaphroditic and, and you know, had, were, had both sexes and was that, is that an issue? It's still out there. But given how widely used these, the atrazine is the top five herbicide used in the world, okay? Before, before glyphosate kind of took over, it was one, it was the number one herbicide and number one in corn, okay? These are some of the symptoms. Remember we talk about inter intervenal chlorosis? This is a good example. Do you see the veins, how they're still green? Between the veins, you get this chlorosis. If we, some of our, over time, if we go back, that's, that was, you know, they sprayed in soybean. This is by mistake or drift, okay? Atrazine, and so you get this chlorosis, and you, you, you typically, they, I, it's unfortunate, not, you can't see the newer leaves. The newer leaves were not affected yet. 
It starts with the older leaves. And you get this, this, basically you see the veins here, the skeleton of the veins, and then in between, between the veins, intervenal, you start getting chlorosis, necrosis. This is a good, this is chlorosis, necrosis starts turning brown, the plant goes, okay? So I thought this was an interesting, again, from my, my colleague out in the Midwest, um, where basically you have injury from atrazine carryover, metribuzin, and what had happened was carryover of atrazine, atrazine or high rates of metribucins. Uh, both of these herbicides, this is not something I'm going to ask you to remember, but you should be aware of that they're very sensitive to pH. Okay? And high pH, if you have high pH soil, it tends to make these herbicides more available. Okay? And so likely to cause injury. Okay? They can, they, they, they can be held on, but then make it available. And the rodent knows these kinds of things here. Right, if you go and plant in there, um, that's where you're likely to see injury. So if you've got corn one year and, and you know, pH, you have pH issues of your soil and you had applied atrazine and now you're following with, with uh, you know, something like soybean, uh, you might run. And this is what they had. They had the corn the previous year. You could see the corn. They were rotating from, you know, they had beans here and then they had corn here. And the following year they were seeing these areas. There were just, there was nothing. And that was, they, they looked at that and it was uh, atrazine. They did some bioassays and it was atrazine carryover because of high pH. They were in the seven something, seven one, I think, pH. So, okay, just a little more information. Well, practically, what are some of these things that can happen? I just want you to be aware and, and just showing you the cell again in terms of this is, you know, photosynthesis. A lot of this happens in this important structure. In a very diagrammatic way, I want you to remember Photosynthesis, simple terms, what happens? And now I'll talk to you about what specifically do these herbs, what does atrazine do? Where does it come in? Do you guys remember basic photosynthesis? Okay. Um, you may not have the exact figure here, but I have an, another of the figures. But just kind of, you got energy, you got photosystem too. Remember the, uh, you know, photosystems where basically the energy is taken in. And what I'm showing here is that the energy here basically takes up, this is the energy, powers this pump, okay, up to this area, and as this then comes down, the energy is released. This is the equivalent of the electron transport chain. As it's released, that energy, okay, that's, that's coming from solar energy is converted into ATP, which is the currency of the plant, okay? And basically, then you have photosystem two, another component, a reaction center within the chloroplast, that again, energy hits it, okay? And again, provides, goes up this electron transfer chain, and when the electrons are losing their energy, go down the pipe, NADPH, you get, you know, NADP plus converted to NADPH. What are these, what are these things? What's ATP and NADPH? What are they used for? They're used for energy in where? The Calvin cycle, the dark reaction. Remember, you used to have the light reaction, the dark reaction. This is what powers then you, you get glucose and you get, you know, carbohydrates and so forth. This is where the energy comes from for growth, for biomass production, okay? And I may have a couple of other ways of showing it. Here's a just go up one step, okay? So you've got energy. This is uh, increasing energy level. Again, elect, you know, light, okay? Hits photosystem to the reaction center, okay? And do you know what this is called when you have water that's being split into photons and electrons? Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, but there's a name, something reaction. Starts with an H. The Hill reaction, do you guys remember the Hill reaction from way back? Well, it's basically the splitting of water to, 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 to get uh, electrons that then are basically pumped up to an electron acceptor. And I'll show you why that's going to be important. So that energy and then the electron transport chain Okay, you get the, so light hits this, breaks water, splits water, the electrons are taken up, okay, they're in an excited state, do you remember that? They're in an excited state, they go to these electron acceptors, okay, within plants, the chloroplast, and then as the energy goes down, okay, as the electrons go down, energy is released, and that energy is used to produce ATP, which is then taken as part of the, the carbon fixation react, carbon, you know, the Kelvin cycle to, to fix carbon. Take CO2, okay, 
and, and that energy, ATP, NADPH, and this is the same for photosystem one. Light hits it, electrons are excited, excited state. As that comes down, you get the fixing of NADPH, and that goes to the Kalman cycle. Okay, so that's, this is the, the light reaction. You're going to see in a sec that these photosynthetic inhibitors very often will affect this guy here. What they're going to do is that these enzymes or these herbicides are going to bind, competitively displace an acceptor protein here called the D1 protein in this okay, part of the, of, of the um, cell structure and basically will not allow the electrons to come down and basically the whole transport chain shuts down okay and and that's going to cause basically no food is being is being produced and this is just uh, a colleague of mine sent me this he said oh this is how I'm showing the students that the hill reaction and so light hitting it water split and then you get the protons and electrons okay I just thought why is he doing this so just want to show there is in simple terms the Calvin cycle okay well, all that you really need to get out of this is that basically, and this thing keeps circling because it goes around. It's going to mean the whole pathway. Remember, you've got six car, you know, carbons. But at the end of the day, look at what you get. You get growth. You get biomass, food. Okay? And where is this energy, ATP, NADPH, coming from? From your light reaction. Okay? I mean, it's, it's a real quick overview, run through photosynthesis. You should be aware of what. You know, that basically does. So what's the mechanism of action? I'm going to take you through that now. Okay? Atrazine, these are herbicides, basically bind, as I said, to this D1 protein in photosystem 2. And you've got a diagram there that shows you this. And, okay? Now I'll come to it as I go through this. But this is where you will see it. Okay? So um, they block the electron acceptor. So... Electrons are excited, they go up to this electron acceptor. Well, the, the herbicide, atrazine, blocks it. It basically outcompetes it, gets in the way. Okay? So these electrons are not transported. Leads to photodestruction of chlorophyll as no electrons move to, through the electron transport chain. You've heard about photo, okay? photodestruction. Under light energy, chlorophyll is broken down. That's why you start getting intervenal chlorosis. Chlorophyll starts going slowly. Okay, it takes a little while for the classical, the atrazine. Carotenoids are also destroyed. What do you know about carotenoids? How important are they? Well, geez, you got a lot of light, high intensity, you got triplet chlorophyll radicals going around, no carotenoids, the plant is going to be toast fairly soon. The unquenched energy from carotenoids is transferred to, okay, from this triplet chlorophyll to oxygen. And you'd say, okay, is that a good thing? Well, there's, it's not that good. And it forms, okay, singlet oxygen, which is another form of, it's, it's another form of, of what we call radicals, very destructive molecules in cells, okay, which destroy the membranes. I mean, very similar to what you, you know, you'll see for paraquat, very, very similar to the lipid biosynthesis. And these guys do a lot of this. Cells are being attacked and, and broken down. And so you get, uh, even in these guys, you get lipid peroxidation over time, okay? Just want to show you, and can you confirm that you do have that in your notes, or at least should be somewhere? Okay, good. Uh, I'm, all I want to show you is I keep talking about this lipid peroxidation. What the hell is going on? Where's that going on? What's happening? And I just want to, and there's a, the, the nice description. That's why I included it. Pathway to lipid. How does this happen? All of these guys with the little dots here, okay, these are all radicals. Dangerous. That's dangerous stuff to have in cells, okay? And so LH is basically a lipid. And you know lipids, they're made up of fatty, you know, fatty acids. They could be very long chain, you know, 23 carbon long, 25 carbon, things like linoleic acids, okay? So what happens is you've got what we call an initiation, okay, factor. It could be the hydroxyl radical, any of these, you know, singlet oxygen that I just talked about, the triplet chlorophyll, these are the, the dangers. What do they do? They seek out in the cell wherever the membranes are, they basically attack the, the membranes, the fatty acids that are going to be the constituents of your lipids. They're going to be basically making up your membranes. They attack them. I mean, it's like, you know, you've heard people, you know, radicals, they have the, you need antioxidants. What do you think they tell you? Take antioxidants. They're good. Because in some cases, you've got very destructive molecules, even in, in our own bodies. 
Well, what happens is you get this, this radical initiating a really cascading, deleterious pathway in, in, for these lipids, okay? And so reaction of a lipid with an unstable initiation factor, which we talked about, could include all of these, which we, you know, where did we get this? You've heard about triple chlorophyll. What happens if you have no carot carotenoids, okay? So what happens is then this lipid radical, okay, reacts with oxygen, step two, forms this peroxidized lipid radical. So it's another form, still very problematic. Can you imagine doing work like this if you're a chemist? This is like, you know, you have to really get into this stuff, okay? And what it does is it attacks a healthy lipid, okay? Uh, LH is the, and it destroys it and also, you know, creates this lipid radical which feeds the system, okay? But eventually you get this LOH, lipid peroxide, Okay, peroxide, which basically then destroys the long chains of fatty acids into little segments, okay, much shorter chain carbon compounds that are useless. I mean, they're useless to the plant. They're not the constituents of, of lipids. They can't, usually you need long chain fatty acids, okay? So just, I mean, again, I'm not going to ask you to take you through these tests, but just recognize what's happening is these radicals, are, are attacking the, the, you know, healthy lipids, fatty acids, breaking them up, okay, into constituents that can't serve the plant very well. They don't. They're just, it's, it's a waste of energy for the plant, and these guys feed on itself, and it just keeps going around and around, okay? The question is, where did these guys come from? Where did they come from? Where did we get the triple chlorophyll? How, how did we get, how, you know, sunlight, and what was missing? The carotenoids weren't around, or the, you know, the chlorophyll, the electron transport chain, there's energy. It's like you guys heating up. I put you in 100-degree weather. I give you no water, and you just, I just let you go there. Over time, that energy is going to overwhelm you. It's going to overwhelm you. That's what happens. So what, what the carotenoids are is basically me giving you some water or putting some air conditioning in to quench, to take away that heat from you so that you could kind of, your, the rest of your, you know, you can breathe, you can, you know, relax. And, that's what this, think about when that happens, when you overheat and the whole system just starts, you start shutting down, okay? They're, they're all anti that are just the right, right, exactly, in this case. But you'll see that in, in, um, in for, for the radical for um, paraquat, it's actually a, an a, anion, uh, a cation, I should say, sorry, a cation. That's, that's in fact what it is. So whenever we, we talk about lipid peroxidation in some of these, Herbicides, we've heard it already with the lipid biosynthetic inhibitors, the ACCases. We've, uh, we've just seen it here, okay, with some of the uh, photosynthetic inhibitors, and we'll see it with paraquat. So this is a common theme here that things over time, now some of them, paraquat goes through it right away. You don't even have to go through, you know, you go through these steps first shot, okay? That's why it's contact herbicide. Others takes a little time. That's why atrazine, you won't see damage for about, you know, probably, you know, five, five, six days, and you won't have death for about two weeks, okay? It's just a slower process. It, it doesn't happen right away, okay? That's what the, the figure that you have in your, in your notes, okay? This is called the light harvesting uh, center. The information is here. It's actually nice to have it there. Energy comes in, hits this photosystem. Two, water is split. You got electrons. The electrons, because of the energy, from the sun, sunlight is, is uh, they're in an excited state. They're taken up into these proteins that contain, embedded in these proteins are what we call these electron acceptors, QB, QA. But the one that atrazine affects is QB. It basically is shut down. So you don't have the electrons going down. Do you, like? you have no ATP being produced, okay? So you're starving plus you're overheating. I mean, that's bad news. It's, it's 100 degrees, you're hungry. Okay, you have no water, no, you know, and of course, that sooner or later you're gone. That's, that's what this is really, if you think about it in that way. So, the atrazine basically replaces this QB and holds on to the electrons. Okay, and the chlorophyll in here just basically becomes, you know, triplets, chlorophyll. Very active molecule and then through oxygen. Okay, so... I'm trying to put it in simple terms, so at least you understand the, the, the keys. To get in there, you know, and, and go through this, you know, you, know, you know, all details of the physiology would be a little more difficult, okay? So, the next group 
which is basically going to be the paraquat and so forth, are foliar applied herbicides that are not translocated. So you apply them to the leaves, and of course, since they don't move very far, you'll see the damage, initial damage is very localized. So with these herbicides, if you don't have good coverage, you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to get the control you want. You also don't want to use these herbicides if you're trying to control creeping perennials with deep rhizomes, creeping roots, tubers because these guys are not going anywhere, okay? They're mostly contact or limited movement herbicides. You have very rapid chlorosis and desiccation. And please note, desiccation, I always see people misspell that. It's one S, two Cs. It's a common, even in papers, I review, you know, manuscripts from scientists that are like, we're all around, they always misspell. They always, desi, two S's, one C, double C, but this is, I would say this is one of the most, this and comparing van and van, T-H-E-N, T-H-A-N, that's a common one. And there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, there, possessor. You, you, when you review manuscripts, you do a lot of it, but this is one. Just keep that in mind, just like perennial, P-E-R-E-N-N-I-E-L, not two R's. A lot of you spell it still perennial with two R's, it's, okay? Si site of action is the plasma in the membranes, okay? So th this paraquat is a good example, it goes right there. What are some of the examples? Okay, the bi biperidiliums, the photosystem, paraquat, diquat, okay, in this group. Diphenyl ethers, acephlorophen. So these guys don't go very far, but boy, they, you know, you see damage within, you know, hours for paraquat, a day or two for acephlorophen, and glufosinate, okay, it's, and I'll talk a little bit about that liberty, which affects this enzyme that also kind of shuts down, very non-selective, okay. Some of the key traits of these herbicides, this group, very rapid kill from disruption of cell membranes, severe damage hours after application. So this is the group you've got to be careful about. Not translocated, contact action, any new growth will be normal. And that's why when you apply, if, if on the exam, practical, we, we show you, you know, a plant that, uh, you know, you're starting to see regrowth. We say we sprayed this, uh, you know, seven days ago, you know, parts of the plant are falling apart. And then you're seeing regrowth, it's probably something like paraquat because it only kills whatever it comes into contact with, okay? Uh, penetration to cy cytoplasm inhibiting uh, photosystem one and this enzyme, protox, and glutamine synthase. This is for glufosinate, okay? And protox is for, for blazer, just to give you some information. Membrane lipids are cut, okay? And then the process generate more free radicals. This is what you're getting accelerated injury, okay? So all of these generally cause some quick action. That's why we wanted to show you the glufosinate and the glyphosate, the Roundup and the Liberty, and we said typically you will see one way that you could tell if they've, because they're both non-selective, right? They would kill everything unless you've got Roundup Ready crops or Liberty Link. But if, you know, if we tell you these are not Liberty Link and you would, you would compare the damage, the one that has the more damage, or at least the faster damage, typically tends to be glufosinate, Liberty, because of what it, it does, you know, whereas glyphosate takes a little longer. So if ever you had to compare the two, and I would ask, which one is it? Is it likely to be? Sometimes it, it wasn't the case when we sprayed them, but often in the field you will see, whoa, three days, four days, I'm seeing this, and it's, you know, it's killing everything. Um, then non-selective and fairly quick acting, uh, and I'm not talking hours here, then it's likely to be glufosinate rather than, than glyphosate. Okay? Glyphosate just takes a little longer to shut the system down because they have different modes of action. What are some of these? Here's, here's the structure. There's paraquat. See, I told you. Okay? Very reactive cation. Okay? Oxyfluorophen and, and so forth. Yes? I've got it, I've also got it in, it, it doesn't, it's not translocated as well. It's, I've got it in this category, but I think in yours, in, in, in the handout, I also have it in its own category. Okay. So, so would, would we see a regrowth? Uh, you would see it to, uh, uh, I mean, it'll still move. It doesn't move. It's not a, like paraquat. I mean, it's, it's relatively moves more than paraquat, but it's, it's not the best in terms of movement, okay? So that's why some people don't really uh, favor it over glyphosate, because glyphosate will, will move. Uh, I see this as, yeah, it moves, but it's almost like a non-selective contact. It's one step up from paraquat, and one, definitely a step or two down from, from uh, glyphosate. 
Okay? So I have it in its own mode of action, and you could, you could use that. Uh, either one, I think there's still some debate, and I, I realize now that I had it as like number eight or nine in there. So, okay? But these are the general characteristics. Um, for paraquat, the mechanism, okay? The mo mode of action is this disrupt cell membranes, but the mechanism, it's a highly unstable free radical. The, you know, the herbicide itself, that's why you get it on your skin, it's trouble. You got your skin, you got lipids. You're gonna get cell membrane leakage, you're gonna get death eventually, okay? Uh, transfers electrons throughout a comp comp uh, causing the reduction of paraquat. This is, you know, reduced paraquat is the safer compound, but in the, in the meantime, uh, this reduced paraquat is reoxidized and forms all these really nasty molecule compounds, including hydrogen peroxide, which a lot of you know, if something is peroxidized, it's cleaned out. I mean, basically lipids. Membranes basically get, get damaged. And there's, a, there's a, a, a figure that kind of shows you this, okay? You've got the ion, the paraquat ion, okay, uh, and basically it's, it's um, reduced, okay, but it's, it's very active, and then in the presence of oxygen, you get the formation of these very reactive, here, the superoxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl, all of these, do you remember the figure on lipid peroxidation? These were the initiating factors. So if right under here I would have put, and maybe that's the way I have it in your notes, I, I've got lipid peroxidation, that's the next step. Is where, where, you know, remember, where, where do we get this, uh, you know, O2 and, and uh, triplet chlorophyll? Well, you get it from these reactions. So the next step under here should be lipid peroxidation. Make a note of it. Here are, are my initiating factors. Guess what's going to happen to my fatty acids? Long chain fatty acids are going to be chopped up, useless. Okay, membranes cannot be formed. The lipids are, are no, no longer there. The thing with this is, with paracord, is how fast acting it is. Okay? So there's some. Some stuff from class in previous years, as I told you, paraquat is non-translocated. Here, Kathy had sprayed, um, yeah, and this was crackgrass, just on this side and showing you that it was not translocated. If this had been glyphosate or even glyphosate, the whole plant in time would have died. But this was, I forgot, four days or three days after application. Here's some hedge bindweed, same thing. Anything that was not hit didn't, didn't die. And here was some... Uh, uh, what happened here? Herbicide drift. Somebody sprayed paraquat or spraying it and it drifted onto corn and hit the leaves. Okay. Now, my sense is that the corn will probably grow out of that because it's not that bad. I mean, you know, remember, it's not going to be translocated. So it's whatever, you know, photosynthetic capacity might be reduced somewhat. It's almost like having a bit of disease there, but uh, the plant is going to recover. But, you know, most likely no tail field where a burn down treatment of paraquat was applied. Often we do that. Okay, no tail field, and you get, you get some of that are nearby. Okay? Glufosinate, just got two more th finished off here. Glufosinate mechanism of action, a different beast in a sense, because it affects this enzyme called glutamine synthase. Okay? What is this enzyme? This enzyme is important in assimilating inorganic nitrogen, basically ammonium. Okay, NH3 from soil into organic compounds. It's kind of neat. Need enzyme, okay? Recycles ammonia, okay? So what happens when this enzyme is inhibited if it's important in the assimilating inorganic nitrogen? Well, what happens is it leads to rapid accumulation of ammonia. Ammonia is not being, you know, particularly during, during photosynthesis and, and photorespiration. This um, ammonia accumulation, so it's not being converted in the ammonia, okay? Simulates inorganic ammonia from soil into organic compounds. The enzyme's not there, you don't have the, these organic compounds being formed. The ammonia backs up, accumulates, okay? And this is because of, we're not really sure yet, but it's probably through an accumulation of uh, toxic compounds that basically disrupt chloroplast structure. Again, you're either gonna go hit a major system process or you're gonna backlog some toxic compounds. This is what seems to be the case with Okay, with glutamine, and this is what they're trying to show you here. Okay, you block this pathway here, the ammonia, okay, back, you know, is, is, is accumulated, okay, just taken up by the roots. Remember, this is an organic fertilizer. This is any of that, okay? So, um, this is important also for glufosinate. Um, best activity is, is in light, 
okay, light, under, under light conditions, okay? So basically then these amino acids, and then basically the plant shuts down, doesn't have this energy, and it basically becomes chlorotic, almost like a nitrogen deficiency. And that's how I kind of look at it. I was kind of, yeah, geez, glyphosate, I almost looked at it. It's, I mean, that's one that's tough to differentiate from nitrogen um, because it's also a non-selective herbicide. This enzyme is in all plants, except for Liberty Link, transgenic crops, okay? The enzyme, they've got an enzyme there that is, is basically tolerant, okay? It's not as affected by the, by the enzyme, okay? There is glyphosate, that kind of chlorotic look. This is in wheat, corn. Okay, it's yellowing. You could almost see it. You, know, you could argue, geez, it's starting to look like it's missing nitrogen or some important compound. And then over time, though, it basically just goes necrotic and just crumbles in your hands. Okay? So, Liberty Link, that's, that's, that's what it's doing. And I'll just finish with the soil applied herbicides to show you these are the mitotic inhibitors. Okay? These are the prowls, very important group. Okay? Treflan, they affect mitosis because they don't allow the microtubules to be formed. And I'll just show you in, in, in graphic, in a, in a diagram. EPTC, we talked about it as being also secondary impact is lipids not being formed, but it also inhibits the emerging shoots. That's, we know that. And, and metallochlor affects both root and shoots, okay? So that's that group. A lot of these are soil applied. They're only soil applied, and they're often PPI. Yes, sir, Bob. Yes, that's the same, that's them. So you don't, yeah, you, you'll often, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, yes, that's right, that's the chloracetamides, that's, it's a synonym. I've seen, you, they use it both. It's the same thing, so either one is correct. Okay, what do these herbicides, again, they're soil applied, we call them disruptors of cell division, so inhibit growth of roots or shoots of seedling. Established plants not killed, very important, do not use these products to try to kill it because often they, you know, they're PPIs and trees. Little or no translocation. They don't go very far, but then again, they don't have to. If they're in the soil and the seed is, is imbibed and the, you know, the little radical hypocotyl is emerging, they're right there, or at least when they, they penetrate the, the soil surface. Little or no foliar activity. Do not apply these on leaves. There, there's no activity there. Highly selective, moderately to highly selective in plant species, very little leaching through soil. It's a good thing for some of these products, okay? I think you all can, there's your pendomethalin, okay? Trifluralin again. So, um, I just wanna take you to, this is just showing you basically mitosis. Remember you got the different phases, anaphase, in this case, sorry, prophase, metaphase. This is where you're gonna run trouble, you have trouble. This is the normal, okay, functioning of a cell. You've got the, uh, the chromosomes, they go to their, from their respective poles. How do you create a second cell? How do you get cell division? You get the chromosomes from each parent, each cell coming together. You've got these centromeres that hold them together. Then these spindle fibers are, are formed. That's where these herbicides come in. They don't allow the spindle fibers to be produced. I.e., these are lines of communication. The respective chromosomes, as they split from the centromeres, typically would go to the respective poles during Anaphase and then in telophase, you basically get each of the cells containing the exact copy of chromosomes from, from the parents, okay? You don't get this. When you get disease or when you get Treflan being sprayed or you get pendomethalin, this is the normal pathway, okay? Look at what happens in metaphase, okay? You see the spindle fibers? This is when you have a denatural aniline, which would be treflan or prowl. These guys line up nicely. These two phases are fine, but when they get to metaphase, if you have no spindle fibers, the connection to allow you the, the, the chromosomes to move to the respective poles, what happens is these guys just sit here, okay? They, and there's basically very poor mixing, and, and in fact, you're gonna have doubling in some cases, very abnormal chromosome structures, which leads to the club rooting, very abnormal root growth, very abnormal shoot growth. It's all because of the spindle fiber production. And this is, came from, from the lab. That's the kind of thing you see in corn when you apply trefline, just the trifluralin, okay? 
So basically cell division, eventually the, the shoots are also affected, okay? And here we're looking at damage to winter wheat shoots, and here effects of broadleaf and grass crops and weeds, no. So here's alfalfa is fine, soybeans fine, tomatoes, but, okay, the grasses, annual grasses, the wheat, the grasses. I just took a shot a few years back. I just sat and looked at all the, the flats to, to show you this, okay? And that's, there's EPTC showing damage to the shoots first, okay? Shoots first and then the roots are affected. So yes? It just, the cells enlarge and they just have a more new cell walls and they actually die. Right. And the cell walls are not, instead of being, you know, nice cylindrical, they become, you know, round. Because those spindle fibers and, and cellulose, okay, is, you know, will shape the cells. Now they, these are missing and so the cells become, you know, not only are the chromosomes all kind of mixed up in there, but also just the, the symmetry of the cells is totally off, okay? So, yeah, it's the kind of thing you definitely, thank God it's, it's just in, in plants, at least this stuff. This is not the kind of stuff you want to see in animals or people, okay? So, 